participation rates in this country are lower than they were in 1977. Think about that. So you have part-time workers, you have people that have given up altogether. You have business startup rates. This business was four. How many people you started? Probably two, three. Now it's like this large business. The only way that we grow is for businesses to be formed. There are more businesses closing than being formed in America. First time ever. And for the first time in American history, people think their children will have less opportunities than what they have. Those are the facts. That's not an opinion. That's the challenge. So why would it be that I think we could be on the verge of the greatest time to be alive? Well, you just keep your head up and your eyes open and your ears alert. There's extraordinary things going on in our lives. We're finding cures for diseases that no one could have imagined. Technology could be your friend or your enemy. If you're ready to gain the power of knowledge, if you have the skills to be able to achieve earn success, a term that Arthur Brooks, I stole from him, you, can, you will be, this will be the most extraordinary time. But if you're not, you can't read and write and calculate math, all this disruption, all this innovation will overwhelm you. And so what do we do to make sure that it's not just an ideal that this is the greatest time to be alive, but it actually will be that way? How do we restore the one thing that has defined the American experience, generation after generation, which is that we hand the baton off to our children and they have more opportunities than what we have. We've been doing it regularly over and over and over again. It defines the extraordinary nature of this country. I believe we can do it. And it starts with high sustained economic growth. High growth matters a lot more than what people think. In fact, now, if you listen to the economists and the smart people, they say it's not possible to grow at more than the new normal of 2%. Well, 2% means that the next generation are not even going to get on the first rung of the ladder. Or if they do get on the first rung, they're going to have a degree, perhaps, and a student loans, perhaps, but they're not going to get the job that they thought they were going to get because opportunity starts with young people being able to, to rise up. And 2% growth makes that hard. 2% growth increases the demands on government. There are 47 million people on food stamps right now. I reject the idea that they want to be on food stamps. People don't want to be dependent on government. We have, for us to succeed, we have to, we have to believe that people want to rise up. They want to achieve our success. The reason people, that many people are dependent upon a, a transfer payment from government, the reason why SSI disability is higher today than it's ever been, the reason why we have this exploding of cost is that there's less opportunities in this country. And so I do believe, I do believe, that the mission for the next president is to bring people together around high sustained economic growth where more people have a chance at earned success. Earned success is what brings happiness, fulfills the Declaration of Independence. Success is that you're, that's your own, where you work hard, you strive to make life better for yourself and your family. That gives you joy, that gives you purpose, that gives you meaning. That's what we need to restore in this country, and I believe we can do it. It means fixing the most convoluted tax code in the world. There are businesses in this country today that are getting bought by smaller businesses overseas because the tax code here is so convoluted and so expensive that we have this, what's called inversions. But we need to re-invert. We need to have a tax code that is the rate is so low and that it's less complicated so that businesses invest in the greatest country in the face of the earth. Why would they go to Ireland instead of the United States? Of course they would come here. We have a big market, we have the best workforce, we have the most talent. This is the place where people come and we have to deal with our taxes. We have to deal with the regulations. Do you think today that we could launch, we could create a launch pad and launch a man to the moon? Now, I have a personal experience here. I live in Florida. I kind of like the fact that those, those rockets are launched from there. You couldn't get a permit from the Fish and Wildlife Federation, uh, Commission. You couldn't get a permit from the myriad of local, state, and federal agencies. EPA would never give you this. The Army Corps, you'd still be waiting to get a permit. Could we build the interstate highway system? We've, we've created so much complication on top of every aspect of human endeavor that the chance to rise up has been stifled. And so challenging every aspect of how rules take place is another element of this. Last night there was a big conversation about immigration. It's all about a legitimate part of our 
our immigration conversation. How do we secure the border? I'm happy to answer any questions on that. But also, if we fixed our immigration system and turned it into a catalyst for high-sustained economic growth, we would, all of us would benefit. Growth creates a, a system where it's not a zero-sum game, where someone's success is someone else's failure. America will never rise up if we, if we fall prey to the liberal progressive agenda that says someone's success means that someone is failing. Someone's success creates the opportunity for more people to succeed. That's how we rise up. That's how we create a successful America. And immigrants can be part of that strategy. We need to embrace the energy revolution in our midst because it's going to create over a long haul high sustained economic growth. Allow us to be energy secure with North American resources. Allow us, frankly, not only to create higher wages, but lower costs for consumers. The best deal that most people in this country have gotten are lower utility uh, bills and lower gasoline prices because of the explosion of energy found in our own country. We should have a North American strategy to sustain economic growth. And the fifth part of a high sustained economic growth strategy is to recognize that our budget will be overwhelmed with two things, debt service and our entitlement system. It will overwhelm everything else. We have to have the courage to fix this, preserve and protect it for those that already have it, for sure. But we need to move to a system to protect it for the next generation that is reformed, that recognizes our demography has changed. Thank goodness for all aging. The alternative is not so hot. If we do those things, we can grow at 4% per year. I know we can do it. And you know why? Because I had a chance to do the exact same thing as Governor of Florida. We cut taxes every year to only $19 billion. I reduced the state government workforce. It wasn't easy. I got tire marks on my right here. That's one mark. That's when we eliminated the protections of career civil service, which are stymied the ability to pay workers for a job well done and inability to fire workers that aren't doing a job well done creates a lethargy that is not the way you want to have government work. Government should be our servant, not our master. So we reduced the number of workers by 13,000. Florida was one of two states to go to AAA bond rate. Compare that to the sorry state of affairs of the United States that had a printed down rate because we haven't come to terms with our budget and structural problems. They called me Vito Corleone because I really did veto 2,500 separate line items in the budget because it didn't go through the right process. We had a reserving policy because who knows, you might get eight hurricanes and four tropical storms in 17 months, maybe not here, but in Florida. When I left, there were $9 billion of reserves. We managed, by the way, to get through that traumatic time with $100 billion of losses in, in Florida. Some of you may have been down there when the hurricane hit. No one heard anybody complain about how Florida handled it. Maybe, maybe in New Orleans, maybe in Louisiana, but not in Florida, because we did what was right. Our team had a service heart. We organized ourselves the right way. I led, and we fixed the problems before they happened, and a lot of people are grateful for that kind of leadership. Leadership matters. We can fix the problems, the economic problems we have, and we can restore America's leadership in the world so that our friends know that we have their back, and our enemies fear us a little bit, not to create war, but to create peace. The only way we create a more peaceful world is to have American engagement, where you get it through peace through strength. And so I'm excited about this campaign. I honestly believe that we're on the verge of the greatest time to be alive. And here's my commitment to you. As you might have seen in the camp in the debate last night, if you follow me around, you'll notice that I'm not angry. I'm, I'm upset. I'm frustrated. I get why people are angry. But I'm not going to appeal to people's anger. That won't solve a single problem. It won't solve the problem that there's six million more people in poverty today than there was the day that Barack Obama got elected president. That should hurt all of us when people are stuck in poverty. It won't solve any problems of the middle class having median income declines year after year after year. The way you solve that is you win the election getting people to believe it's possible to fix these things, and then act with civility to forge consensus to solve the problems. The big things in this country are going to require Democrats and Republicans working again. I know that sounds like a crazy idea, but for most of the 240 years of our history, that's the way it's been. And we have to restore that. It's one thing to, to you know, 
articulately say how bad things are and why you're going to fight for people, I respect that enormously. But in order to win, to serve, we have to fix these things, which means that we also have to assume that the people that don't agree with us don't have bad motives. You start with that premise, and you win campaigning like this rather than like this, then we can fix these things. And we will fix these things. And when we do, we'll look back and say, this was a time where there was a lot of uncertainty, where there was a lot of fighting. But somehow, someway, as we've always done it as a country, we managed to come together to fix things to move forward. That's why I'm running for president, and that's why I would love to have your vote. Thank you all for Department. 
there was a reform last year after this scandalous behavior of waiting lists where people got bonus and the waiting list went down because the people did, the, the vets didn't get care. That's not the intent, obviously, of what the system was designed for, but it's scandalous. In fact, it was people have lost their lives because of it. You would have thought that the hammer bit would have been brought down. Well, no, it wasn't. In fact, after the Congress passed a law dealing with this crisis, there's only been one person fired because of it. So real civil service reform means that you have employment, employment protections like we do in the private sector or in Florida. There's, there's employment protections for state government workers, but you don't have a lifetime guarantee for work. You don't have benefits that are higher than everybody else, your, your equivalent people in the, in the private sector. So I would suggest, and I have suggested, that through attrition, you can lower the number of people working in state government, I mean, federal government, and rebalance the, the benefits so that you get a more servant-oriented workforce. If you do those things, I think you're going to be in better shape. As it relates to the priorities of the military, we may have a disagreement. I don't know. I think the first priority of our federal government, if you had to ask it to do one thing, so not, rather than say, we do all these things and we can't do anything about that, so the new money, what should it look like? That's not the way I think we should look at it. We should look at what is the first priority? If only did it did one thing, what would it be? My guess is it would be to keep us safe. I mean, that's what the, the state government exists, local government exists, we have all sorts of other entities to do many other things. And the federal government has a role in all that. He has to do one thing, is to protect us, which means you have to have a fighting force that is well compensated, well trained, well protected with the best equipment. And right now we're cutting the military. Each year with the sequester, we're, we're shrinking the military and our force capabilities have, uh, have diminished. And the corollary to this is because we're shrinking the military, we're also having an explosion of veterans coming in back into the country. And I'm not sure we're ever ready for that kind of explosion given how inept and incompetent the Veterans Department is. As President of the United States, I will urge Congress to put more money back into the military in a reform procurement system and provide support for the veterans who have earned it. Talking about people that have earned something, that is what they should be in the front of the line. And right now they're not.
I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I don't know why I'm thinking about hurricanes now. I guess it's the 10th anniversary of Katrina. The hurricane Charlie hit 11 years ago. It was a Cat 3 or Cat 4 storm that was devastated in Port Charlotte. This is the oldest, this is the city with the oldest population, average population in the United States. And we went to the special needs shelter, so I'm putting it in quotes. It was no electricity, no nothing. It was really, it was a huge storm. And the first person I saw was an 85 year old, beautiful woman who was lost, couldn't, didn't really kind of disoriented. And I gave her a big hug, and, I, and she said, I, you know, I don't know what to do. I've lost everything. And I, and I called her on my BlackBerry. It was a satellite BlackBerry back then. I called her caregiver, soon to be caregiver. Her son was in New York, and I said, get your butt down here. I mean, disconnecting from the people that provided for you just seems completely wrong to me. And so services ought to be there to provide for people that are giving back. Which is exactly what you're doing. Secondly, you're totally right about research and development. We do spend six hundred million dollars on Alzheimer's, and there are other diseases that that continue to get sizable sums more. But we've already found great, we've made great progress. And government can't just be about the entrenched interests. We're always focusing on the incumbents. We're always protecting something that already exists. And I don't think we should think that way. We, we should be thinking, what's the future look like? How does government provide the support? And this is the only place where you're going to find, if you don't have the federal NIH funding for the cures for diseases, you're not going to, there's no other place to go. You can have great philanthropists, you can have private sector people developing programs, but without that basic research, you're not going to get to where we need to be. So I totally believe that we should be spending more than $600 million. And I appreciate you for having